Good afternoon. Welcome to Thursday's Working Lunch. I'm Adrian Childs. Record profits for Barclays. They were up 20% at £4.6 billion, but it's not the high street banks themselves which are providing the growth. And the FTSE, uh, it's up, but it's still having trouble holding above the 5,000 level. A technological free lunch in schools. Uh, we visit a school which has locked thousands off its computer bill by installing free software. Coming up too, more of you not enjoying the cruise you never got. We've heard from many of you who've not had the £10 cruise promised in the Daily Express promotion. We're told it's going to be put right, but by whom? And I'm inside the heart of what was one of Britain's most important nuclear power research centres to find out how you go through the process of decontaminating a site that once had nine nuclear reactors. Barclays reported full-year pre-tax profits of £4,600. £103 million, pounds. it's £4.6 billion. that is up 20%. The final dividend, that has come in at 24 pence, that's a rise of some 17%. So, a lot of money, where did it actually come from? Now, most of it came from the most obvious place, those Barclays banks in the UK. That division made £2,474 million, pounds, or around Two and a half billion. Now that's made up of business banking and ordinary customers banking, otherwise known as retail banking. Profits at the retail division actually fell a little this year, although profits at the business banking division actually rose. Barclays Capital, uh, that made just over a billion pounds. Barclay Card, the things lots of us have in our wallet, uh, made 801 million or 0.8 billion. Uh, global investors, uh, uh, that's the asset fund managers who invest money on behalf of big city companies and Barclays also have some retail funds for ordinary investors. That made about a third of a billion. Uh, that's about the same as the international division. And you've got private client division, which includes Barclays stockbrokers. It's actually the smallest part of the uh, group, but it still makes uh, 0.14 billion pounds. That's 140 million. Of course, in those terms, it sounds a lot more. Now, although it was a small part of the overall profits, that division grew faster than any other. So, uh, what about where this company actually came from? Well, there was, in fact, a Mr. Barclay. Sure, he looked much like that, but that's our best attempt. It started actually in 1736 when Mr. James Barclay brought together his family goldsmith and banking business. Now, jumping forward quite a lot to 1896, uh, what then happened, it combined with 20 other banks to form Barclay and Company. Well, today the banking sector is enormously important, certainly within the FTSE 100. Banking shares account for 22.9% of the whole index. Uh, they haven't been amongst the best performing sectors over the past year. Uh, share prices in the banking sector have risen on average by around 10%. Uh, sounds good. The real estate sector, for instance, is up 40% over the same sector. Now, within that 10% average, there are some better movers. Barclays are actually the second best performing share in the sector, up 15%, only beaten by HBOS there. Uh, you can see some of your other favourites, and in fact, if I click that on, you might be able to see the Internet Bank Egg is uh, the only share in the sector to lose money 30% down there. The rest of the smaller companies are still making uh, some decent returns. Now, this is what happened to Barclays shares over the past 12 months. Uh, there they go. Nice. And then this big rise over there. This was a very strong rise in July, uh, since when the shares have risen some 31%. What happened there, around about July, they announced some job cuts, 250. More importantly, I think they also published first half results in August, so around there, uh, which were up 23%. And that really formed the basis for that starting to rise there. What we're seeing today, though, I'm afraid, a small fall in their shares, down 1% at 586 uh, 87, taking the froth of uh, some of those. Start of the banking season, a Standard Chartered report next week. The other business news, interest rates have been left on hold at 4.75% for the sixth month in a row. The decision comes despite increasing signs of a strengthening economy. Things like manufacturing figures, they were revised upwards yesterday. Gas and electricity companies have been warned to improve their record on disconnections. The Commons Trade and Industry Select Committee says more could be done to prevent vulnerable customers getting into debt through not paying their bills. It's also criticised the energy firms for making too many errors over billing and meter readings. A new colour-coded labelling system is to be introduced to indicate how environmentally friendly new vehicles are. Cars will be rated on a scale from A to F based on their carbon dioxide emissions. It's similar to the system you already see on fridges. Electric vehicles get an A grade, smaller cars score a C, while 4x4 uh, four four vehicles, for example, score a very poor F. 
The labels are due to be in use at all UK car showrooms by September. BT's to double broadband speeds for most of its home and business customers. The increased speeds will come at no extra charge. This follows a similar move by the internet service provider AOL. Uh, the new speeds come into effect on the 17th of February for home customers and the 1st of April for businesses. Bungalows are the happiest places to live and the ideal location for one is Spalding in Lincolnshire. This from Halifax General Insurance, which must have had a quiet month to start concocting this stuff. Anyway, they uh, somewhat obviously say that the happiness of a home is influenced by a complex interaction of physical factors, proximity to amenities, as well as personal and emotional considerations. But what else would the happiness of a home depend on? Rather more interesting, though, is the fact that the first bungalow in Britain was built by a Colonel Bragg, who returned from, uh, returned from India and built a lodge with Indian features in Norwood, South London in the 1860s. He called it the bungalow. And in tomorrow's hour-long working lunch, we'll be tackling your technology questions. Um, and uh, Rob will be meeting the man awarded the title uh, Britain's Most Energetic Boss. Sharing, as most parents will be tired of telling their kids, is good. It's a good thing. Uh, a great number of computer software developers and users are promoting free and shared programs. Will this change the world into a place where there's such a thing as a free lunch after all? Simon's been to a school in Felixstowe to find out. Let's face it, Microsoft is everywhere. Most homes use its Windows operating system and businesses, and then there's the programs that you can run on that. Word for writing, Excel for spreadsheets, publisher, access, the database, all of those things which are often joined together in something called Office. But if you're a household, you might have to pay hundreds of pounds to use Microsoft software. A business might have to pay thousands. And if I were to tell you that there's software that you could use which you don't have to pay for that can do a lot of the same jobs, well, you'd be interested, wouldn't you? You OK? Yeah. You OK? Orwell High School in Suffolk was interested, and now it's been converted to what's called the open source movement, in which software is shared between users and is often free. Well, we've got Star Office, and that's basically got most things that Microsoft has, and it's got things like um, text documents, spreadsheets, presentation, presentations, same as sort of and drawing and things like Is it the same, basically? It's the same, well, basically. There's the same. a couple of programs that are on Microsoft that aren't on and this, here. Yeah, and, and there's one or two different. things on here that aren't on Microsoft. So what the school has done is to replace the Windows operating system on its computers with a rival called Linux, which was free. And Microsoft Office is replaced by Star Office, a version of open source software which was free after they'd paid a small amount for the first copy. We've got KDE Desktop, which is the environment that students load up when they first start. It's a Linux-based environment. They start to work. They open a whole suite of open office type programs, Star Office, Scribus Desktop Publishing Package. All of those packages are free of charge and are vaguely equivalent to the Microsoft equivalents. And do they work? They work incredibly well. Um, with the exception of the database, we've yet to find an alternative replacement for access. There is an extremely powerful alternative to spreadsheet, to presentation package PowerPoint, and to word processing. This room is the brain or nerve centre of Orwell High School's computer system. Two old servers here, which are basically storage units for data. And this is where they have had to spend some money, particularly on a new system of servers. And what's interesting here is that all the computing that's going on in the school, which you'd expect to happen on the 150-odd PCs, computers, that are around the school, is actually happening here in the servers, so the processing and the storing of data. And that's a feature of their new system, Linux. Well, it's cost £15,000 to put this stack in, but if you take everything together, they claim they've made massive savings. Because it's the central servers which do most of the work, the school hasn't had to upgrade old computers on the network. That's a big saving. And then there's the saving on software. Software side, I now don't need to license any of my operating systems. They're all free. I don't need to license any of my core office suite. That's free. And that saved me about 15, 16,000 pounds a year. Um, add those costs up over several years, it's a really serious amount of money. It's all right. I don't know if I like it as much as Microsoft, but it's okay. 
Okay. What do you think of it? It's quite good. It's quite fast um, to load up as well. It took a bit of time getting used to, but you get the hang of it after a while. Yeah. It was quite different when we first got it in, and when we first sort of set it up, we didn't know how to work it, so the computers kept crashing. So how does all this look to the head of a company called RM, which installs and runs computer systems in nearly a third of Britain's schools? He mainly uses Microsoft, and he warns that switching completely to an open source system can present problems. The biggest issue, I think, for schools, and I think for people at home, is what software do they want to run? Today, the majority of software still expects Microsoft Windows, and certainly in the schools market, of the 5,000 educational packages are, that are out there, the vast majority of them will only run on Microsoft Windows. And, uh, and so I think that that's the big determinant. Or for, you know, if you're a user at home and you go down the local PC shop and you look down the shelves of software, which of them will run on Linux? And actually today, the majority will not. For certain applications, they can be really, open source can be great, but in general, for general computing, I think you need to be sceptical. Okay. Right. That fear doesn't stop schools, businesses and people at home experimenting with open source programs, many of which will run on a Windows computer in any case. And some of them may become out-and-out -out enthusiasts, like John Osborne, for shared and free software. Some news just in. One of the country's few remaining coal mines is to close because its remaining reserves can't be viably mined. Its production at Welbeck Colliery in Mansfield in Knotts will be phased out over the next 12 months, um, so say the owners of UK Coal. This pit was sunk in 1912, employs 520 workers, some of whom could